So the wheel of craziness spins again when it comes to Department of Player Safety. What's going on, Avalanche fans? Welcome to the Locked On Avalanche podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, Chris Maselli, with another episode of the podcast dedicated to your Colorado Avalanche. And on today's episode, it's like a revolving door that we just keep talking about Department of Player Safety. And when they're this ridiculous, it's just going to keep coming up. And when it keeps revolving around the Avalanche, it's just going to keep coming up. So we'll discuss what they've done. Well, what they've done and what they haven't done, which seems to be part for the course for Department of Player Safety. So we'll talk about them. We will look at the Avalanche schedule for the month of November. Not a ton of games, but pretty favorable when it comes to the Avs. But there is a possible problem with the teams that they're playing. So we'll get to all of that. And yes, this is Locked on Avalanche. It's a hockey show. But when a legend of the Denver and Colorado sports teams leave, I'll have to say my goodbyes. So uh, all of that and see where else it goes. But first things first, thank you for making this your first listen of the day. That is always appreciated. And follow the show on social media outlets on Twitter, L-O-P-N underscore Avalanche. On Instagram, search for Locked On Avalanche and send questions, comments, concerns, opinions to LockdownAvalanche at gmail.com. And of course, follow the show's YouTube channel. Search for you on YouTube for Lockdown Avalanche. Hit the subscribe button and get notified whenever a new episode drops. So it just, it seems, doesn't it seem like Department of Player Safety has it out for the Avalanche? And I hate saying that because I'm sure every fan from every fan base is thinking the same thing. Uh, you know, that the the inconsistencies with their suspensions and fines, I, I it can't be minimized. And it is plain as day. The NHL has a lot on their plate right now going on with uh, the Kyle Beach situation and the Blackhawks and, you know, the sexual assault. They, like, and they have that that they seem to be doing nothing right with even now. Uh, and, and dealing with it now, they seem to be doing nothing right. Um, but, you know, this is the, the, the Department of Player Safety side of things and the safety of the players on the ice. It just seems non-existent and inconsistent. And we've seen many times the Avalanche have been involved in this several times already. And we've just got through October. Obviously, the stuff with Gabe Landeskog. And I, at the time, said that was that that was a, I was okay with that ruling. I felt that that was deserved, and I thought to myself, "Well, maybe Department of Player Safety is off on the right foot. Maybe they had some internal uh, meetings and said, you know, we have to be a little bit more consistent." And because that was the first game of the year, and they ruled uh, two games for Landeskog, I was like, "Okay, I, I will. I'd be will, willing to accept that." Since then, I'm not accepting that anymore. And it, it, it's amazing that it's been only a couple of weeks since then, and they've been so egregious in, in their, their lack of consistency. First of all, you have the Sam Girard hit. Stamkos, nothing. He gets nothing, not even a penalty in the game. And then the next day or a couple of days later, Stamkos does it again to somebody I think was on Buffalo, and he got nothing. And I... Don't think he even got a penalty in that game either. And then you got Jack Johnson, who, and and this isn't a Department of Player Safety thing. This is on the ice. He got a game misconduct for uh, a a good hockey play. If you wanted to give him a penalty on that, fine. But for a game misconduct is, is crazy. But that's not Department of Player Safety. That's on the ice. And then you had the Bo Byram hit. You had the Bo Byram hit. From uh, Brandon Duhame, he got, you know, he he did get a game misconduct for it and, you know, all the penalties that came with that, but nothing afterwards. And Department of Player Safety came out and said, we're not going to give him any extra punishment for that hit, which was just ridiculous. I mean, you are Department of Player 
safety. That was not a player who was in a safe position. And luckily, Byram came back in that game. And maybe that's why they didn't do anything because Byram came back. All right. Well, then what about Gerard? Gerard didn't come back for was I think it was two games. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much you're taking into consideration that a player is, is in, how injured the player is or not. And how <clears throat> much into consideration you're taking the player who did the hit. Are you not fining or suspending Stamkos because he's a quote good guy? Are you not fining or suspending Duhame because he's a rookie and he doesn't have a history of this? Like, that's your metric? Base it on the play, on the specific play. All that other stuff maybe comes into effect afterwards, but was that play, regardless of who did it, worthy of a suspension or a fine? A hundred percent. And I think Gabe Landeskog's was. I don't now. And what you're doing is opening the door for players to just have free reign to knock the crap out of somebody and do some real damage. And then what are you going to do? You're going to have no leg to stand on when somebody seriously gets hurt. And you can't turn around and say like, that now you're not you have an opportunity to police it right now and you're not doing it and don't tell me that you can't because clearly you did it with Gabe Landeskog and then you just did it Trevor uh Zegras on the Ducks got boarded by Cedric Paquette and they just gave him a two-game suspension now if you go look at that hit was it bad yeah should it have been boarding yeah but by comparing that hit to the other ones that I've just talked about, just with the avalanche, those other hits, the hit on Sam Girard was worse. The hit on Bo Byram was worse. And you gave him two game suspension. Why? Because Paquette has a little bit of a history of it. Again, I don't know what your metric. I mean, I, I, I should go watch the video and I apologize that I didn't do that because I do think they released a video for him as to why, they suspended him for two games. But this goes back to if you're not going to suspend a guy, release that video. I want to know why you're not suspending him. When everybody is up in arms and tagging you on Twitter, and I know that doesn't mean anything, but you know conversations are happening and you're not paying attention to them. Conversations are happening about the things that you're not doing and you are deliberately ignoring them because you're not releasing anything as to why <clears throat> it's not going to be a suspension. And then Alex Ovechkin does it. Ale the, the hit Alex Ovechkin gave, and I don't know the player that he that he he uh, put the hit on, is very similar to the one that Paquette just did. Very similar, and Ovechkin got nothing. It's like, <clears throat> and, and I and I'm tr I'm just I'm trying to be on the side of consistency. If you're not going to call it on Ovechkin then don't call it on Cedric Baquet because they were similar. And if you're not going to call those two and then you don't call Landeskog and you don't call Stamkos twice and you don't call Duhame, then fine. Then we can say they're being consistent. We don't agree with them because they're dangerous hits, but they're being consistent and not doing it. We can have that argument. That's a different argument than – we don't know when a player gets thrown into the boards what Department of Player Safety is going to do. That's the ridiculous thing in all of this. Is they are like they're not paying attention to their name. They're not paying attention to their name of Department of Player Safety. Is what happened to <clears throat> are you protecting the safety of Sam Gerard and Bowen Byram on those two hits? Tell me how you're protecting the safety of those two guys. Because you're, you're not is the answer. Maybe it, it, like, are you satisfied with what the on the ice call was? Are you satisfied that Duhame got a, a game misconduct and he's kicked out for the rest of the game? Is that the severity of his punishment? Then at least just say that. But when you get crickets for the things that people want to know, 
it it literally i mean there's if if you know you're on twitter and you follow on twitter like you see a lot of people throwing that meme around with just that dude spinning the wheel and it's just going behind him and that is so true it is so so true it's it's confusing and i think that's the the sad part about it, is there is no we as fans should be able to watch a game and see somebody get hit and know immediately that's going to be X, Y, and Z. That's going to be a a fine. That is going to be a suspension. But we don't. We're only left to wait and see what Department of Player Safety wants to do as the wheel turns. All right. Let's uh, get into direct TV stream and then talk about the avalanche schedule for the month of November. <clears throat> so direct TV stream. Uh, and does this sound familiar to you? You have one device that lets you catch the games live. Another that lets you stream your favorite shows and you're watching the sports highlights on your phone and you've got your neighbor's best friends log in for everything else. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all of the entertainment that you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream. And it brings your live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before. So you can watch your favorite sports, movies, and shows all in one place. That means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again. And the best part is that there is no annual contract. So get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your TV together with Direct TV Stream. You can learn more at directtv.com. So again, that website is directtv.com to learn more about direct TV stream and compatible devices are required and content varies by package. Okay, so for the month of November, the avalanche ended October, first month of the season uh, in a better place than when they started. So you obviously want to carry that over into November. So what does it look like for November for the Avs? Kind of sporadic, not, sporadic games and not a ton. The Avs, for the first three weeks of November, play uh, two games each of the first three months. Or three months, three weeks. And then the last week of the month, they do play four games. So a total of 10 games played for the Avs. And I'm not going to get into December because that's next month. But if you just look at December, it's like... Bam, there's very few days off in in December. I think there's 16 games in December with, like I said, only 10 in November. So they start the the month off uh, this Wednesday against Columbus. And that's all you're getting this week when it comes to uh, the team that you're playing. You're playing two games this week, and they're both against Columbus. So Wednesday is at home. Saturday is on the road. Uh, I am planning on doing a crossover with Jay Forster from Locked On Blue Jackets for Wednesday's show to kind of talk about. Uh, and him and I did did one over the the off season, but we'll do another one because I think the Blue Jackets are, are, are a solid team, <clears throat> and they're they're playing. I think to their potential right now. I think they're over five hundred by a game or so. But they're not a bottom of the barrel team. I think they're that mid range team that could comfortably be in a playoff spot by the end of the year, possibly. So you have those two games and then next week. So after that, that, that's Wednesday and Saturday. Then you got four days off, man. When's the last time that's happened for the Avs? And then you are playing uh, next Thursday at the, those two games are at home Thursday and Saturday, Vancouver and San Jose. And then you have three days off. And the next two games in the third week of the month are both on the road. You're up in Vancouver for a quick trip up north. And then you head a little bit south after that for your first game ever against the Kraken in Seattle. So that is the third week of November, two games on the road. And then the final week, uh, you are playing four games. Three out of those four games are at home. And you are playing Ottawa and then Anaheim. Those are at home. And then Friday, you're playing on the road in Dallas. And then you are coming home the very next day. So you're playing a back-to-back. 
uh, at home against the Predators. But those are your only two division games in the month of November are the last two on the road against Dallas and at home against Nashville. Now that poses a little bit of a problem because you're playing 10 games. Only two of them are against division teams. That's tough to make up ground in the standings on your own. You're pretty much relying on other teams to take out other teams in your division. And I haven't gone and looked at, you know, what St. Louis's schedule is and how many division games they're playing or same thing with the wild. Cause sometimes you can rely on, you know, other teams beating the teams above you. And then you take your, your business and obviously you can catch them. It might be tough for the avalanche to catch who's above them right now, or to make up a ton of ground, unless someone like St. Louis or Minnesota just completely go into free fall, which you don't expect to happen, especially, especially for St. Louis, Minnesota, I think is, is still a good team. Could they come back down to earth? Yeah, but it, they're still gonna be tough to catch because you're not playing them first of all. So you can't take up your own, take care of your own business against them. So that's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to gain a lot of ground, but look at all these teams, Columbus. Okay. Pr- good average to good team above 500 team. Vancouver, you're playing them twice. They are bottom feeders right now. You're playing San Jose overachieving. You got to be always be cautious of a team like that, but could they come back down to earth relatively soon? Maybe. So you should be able to handle them. Seattle struggling, Ottawa struggling, but better Anaheim. You know, they're, they're not the greatest team. I think maybe I believe they're under 500 now, but close to 500. So maybe even for them a little bit overachieving. And then Dallas who right now is not playing as well as they should, but you know, you're not playing them till the end of the month. So maybe they kind of figure things out then and Nashville, who I think you are tied with right now as of this recording. So most of like none of these teams are upper echelon teams, none of them. So when you look at this, you're saying, okay, Avalanche were playing 10 games, six of them, let's see, three, four, yep, six of them are at home. So four on the road. What would be realistic for the Avalanche? And again, none of them are cream of the crop teams in the NHL. You are middle of the road to bottom of the standings. Maybe not, maybe, well, right now they are, yes. But by the end of the year, you're, you're expecting a lot of these teams to not be really in the race for much, with the exception of Columbus. So what, what would be good for the Avalanche for 10 games? I think at, you have four road games. So say you split those. So you go two and two on the road. And then you have six road games, <clears throat> or excuse me, you have six home games. And they are Columbus, Vancouver, San Jose, Ottawa, Anaheim, Nashville. You you should win all of those. You really should win all of those games. But let's say you just lose one of them. That puts you at seven and three on the month. If you can do seven and three for for a month, lose one home game and split the two road games, I think that's that that's a good month. If you go eight and two, that's even better month. So think of it as a a hole for the avalanche, not that difficult of a month of the teams that you're playing against. And it's favorable to you because you have more home games and road games and the teams you're playing are all beatable. They, They are teams that you should be beating. And maybe you split with Columbus because I do think they are a better team than people give them credit for, but Everybody else, nobody else on for the month strikes fear in you. So, yeah, I would think, you know, seven and three, I will take it. Anything more than that, obviously, is just uh, icing on the cake, in my opinion. So uh, let me know what you guys think. Hit me up on uh, Twitter or uh, LockdownAvalanche at gmail.com. Okay, let's get to betonline.ag, and we are back and better than ever. A new web interface for the start of the basketball season with more prop bets, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. 
head to our new updated desktop or mobile device website to sign up today and receive a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code locked on to receive your bonus from basketball, football, the World Series, which is almost over. The NHL, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage on all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports, favorite sports. It's where the game starts. That is betonline.ag. All right. Yes, we are uh, locked on Avalanche. We cover a National Hockey League team. And, uh, you know, you, you have tuned in because you love the Avalanche and you love hockey. Uh, if you are a fan of the Colorado sports scene, even if you're not, you no doubt know about Von Miller. And I'll just start off first by saying definitely go listen to Lockdown Broncos. Uh, Cody and Sayer have a, the, a breakdown of the trade, what the Avs got in return. Was it a good deal? What does this mean for the Avalanche going forward? Uh, go there for the the breakdown of what this all means for the Denver Broncos. That's not my gig. I'm not going to do that. I am a lifelong Broncos fan. Uh, I, I know a good amount about the sport, but that's I'm not going to steal their thunder on this. I'm just going to talk about, uh, you know, m- losing a franchise player, an all time franchise player. And if you listen to this show for, you know, we're over 400 episodes now. So if you've been listening at any point, uh, you know that I don't typically say I have a favorite player. And I constantly say how Kale McCarr is getting close to that, close to being like, if I, if you're going to hold my feet to the fire and say, who's your favorite player? Uh, I, I would just say, okay, it's Kale McCarr. But this right here is the reason why I don't get attached to players. Um. I get attached to my teams and I don't care who plays for them. If they're wearing the colors of the team that I enjoy, then I root for them. And just the way sports are and the way free agency is guys don't hang around. The loyalty factor in sports is very low. Von Miller wasn't that guy. You heard Von Miller over and over again, say he absolutely loves playing in Colorado Loves playing for the Broncos, signed a massive contract, wanted to play his entire career with one team. And what happens when the team's not playing well? The you know, he didn't go request a trade. You know, the the powers that be, your 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 GM and the president, whoever makes the decisions, decided it was time to get some return. And Von Miller's on the downside of his career. Um, so I guess from a business standpoint, is it smart? Yeah, but that's why I could never be a GM in in any sport because I would see the value that a a all-time player for a specific franchise like Von Miller brings to a team, and I wouldn't get rid of him for that sole purpose. I wouldn't care about the money, and that's another reason I couldn't be GM because, yeah, you're you're, you're unloading a a hefty contract and you're opening up a lot of salary cap. But to me, that wouldn't matter. What, what would matter is that you, your fans are invested in this guy. And I wouldn't want to get rid of him because of that. And I always say, like, yeah, you know, in, th- in three or four years, a guy is gone when his, his contract comes up. And for a lot of people who do get invested in players, it wasn't three or four years. It was 11 years this guy was on this team. It's just a different mentality and and I know you know the younger generation they do get attached to players they don't they it's almost like I'm loyal to my teams and and the youth of the nation is loyal to the player and they'll follow the player around and that's fine I don't have a problem with that but I just come from a different generation I guess where you 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 have a favorite team and you had a favorite player and most of the time that player stuck around for their their entire career with that team. It just doesn't happen anymore. I get it. I understand it. But I just feel like when you have a player of his uh, caliber, and even though that caliber has has dwindled a little bit because he's had injuries, 
still what he means to the grand scheme of the Denver Broncos and and the Colorado sports scene, I think is more meaningful than a second and a third round pick. Just where I'm um, coming from on that. So, yeah, I mean, was he a favorite? Yeah, when, when a guy sticks around for that long, sure, they become a favorite player. Um, hockey's a little bit different. You do have, obviously, free agency is what it is in every sport. Most of the time, the superstars superstars hang around. You know, like Crosby, he's likely not going anywhere. If he does, it'll be in the last, like, like Lungfist, like Henrik Lungfist on the Rangers. It that was time. I get that. You know what I mean. And and he didn't even play for Washington. I don't know how much time Von Miller has, but he's in his eleventh year. He could play for another three four years, like Peyton Manning did. So the the tide has completely shifted on uh, loyalty to franchises on both ends, on the players' end where they want out of town when team's not doing well. And in the front office end, like you're seeing right now, when a team's not doing well, they're going to unload the big contracts. Doesn't matter what that individual player means to the fan base and the franchise. They want to get some return on him. I get it all. I get both sides of it. Just telling you where I come from. That's why it's it's difficult to get so attached to individual players because chances are, you know, the Derek Jeters of the world are are not happening anymore. Uh, the Kobe Bryant's of the world are not happening anymore. It's just the way sports are. And, and, and when you have moments like this, when you have moments of, of, of a guy that's meant so much to this team, that Super Bowl 50 performance by the, the Broncos as a whole and him individually around halfway through the third quarter of that Super Bowl, I knew it was in the bag. Because watching him play, he was doing whatever the heck he wanted. When a player like that takes over and he's on your team, that is fun to watch. A lot like when Nathan McKinnon decides to take over, it's fun to watch when it's happening for your team. So um, he, he, and he didn't go ask for a trade. I think he was in this for the long haul. He wanted to, to write the ship for them and it just didn't happen. So, you know, you hear it all the time. It's a business, and that's the truth. Sports are a business. They are not uh, beholden to you or I or any fan base. Uh, they are in it for the business. And uh, if a guy of, of his caliber, they can get something for him, they go ahead and make the deal. <clears throat> uh, that's why I said I could, I could never be a GM. I would have hung on to Von Miller till he said, um, I'm retiring. Okay, you spent your entire career with us. Thank you for your service. So, and I do. He was fun to watch. He's going to be fun to watch. Uh, You know, he's got a Super Bowl, obviously. So, I mean, it's not like I'm going to be a Rams fan all of a sudden. So he's accomplished so much. So uh, thank you, Vaughn, for for the last 11 years. It's been fun. And uh, who knows? Maybe I guarantee you he signs one of those one day contracts, which I think are a little ridiculous uh, to sign as a Bronco Hall of Famer, probably ring of fame for the uh, yeah, for the Broncos. Definitely. So uh, it's been fun while it lasted. And uh, that's going to wrap it up for us. So um, thank you, everybody, for tuning in, making it your first listen of the day. And like I said, make your second listen. Go listen to Lockdown Broncos, where they uh, break it all down and get into the ins and outs of what it means for the Broncos going forward. I got to figure some things out. So that will be it for today, everybody. It is greatly appreciated that you tune in and we'll see everyone tomorrow. Have a good one.